morning. This morning's uh, scripture comes from Isaiah 53, New Living Translation. Who has believed our message? To whom has the Lord revealed his powerful arm? My servant grew up in the Lord's presence, like a tender green shoot, like a root in dry ground. There was nothing beautiful or majestic about his appearance. Nothing attracts us to him. He was despised and rejected, a man of sorrows, acquainted with deepest grief. We turned our backs on him and looked the other way. He was despised, and we did not care. Yet it was our weaknesses he carried. It was our sorrows that weighed him down. And we thought his troubles were a punishment from God, a punishment for his own sins. But he was pierced for our rebellion, crushed for our sins. He was beaten so we could be whole. He was whipped so we could be healed. All of us, like sheep, have gone astray. We have left God's path to follow our own. Yet the Lord laid on him the sins of us all. He was oppressed and treated harshly, yet never said a word. He was led like a lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep is silent before the shearers, he did not open his mouth. Unjustly condemned, he was led away. No one cared that he died without descendants, that his life was cut short in midstream. But he was struck down for the rebellion of my people. He had done no wrong, and he never deceived anyone. But he was buried like a criminal. He was put in a rich man's grave. But it was the Lord's good plan to crush him and cause him grief. Yet his life was made an offering for sin. He will have many descendants. He will enjoy long life, and the Lord's good plan will prosper in his hands. When he sees all that is accomplished by his anguish, he will be satisfied. And because of his experience, my righteous servant will make it possible for many to be counted righteous. For he will bear all their sins. I will give him the honors of a victorious soldier because he exposed himself to death. He was counted among the rebels. He bore the sins of many and interceded for the rebels. I'm guessing the name August Rodan isn't a household name you're very familiar with, but I am guessing you are familiar with one of his sculptures. This is one of them. The sculpture is called what? The Thinker. Yeah. He sculpted this in the year 1880, and from that they made different casts that they could then reproduce. And so there are 28 of them spread across the world, different universities, museums. And uh, Rodin has, he has captured of what it really means to be a human being. Somebody who you can see in his deep, kind of on his chair, kind of thinking, pondering, wondering. And you don't know what he's quite wondering about, but as a human being, we know that is true for all of us. How it all comes together with neurons and brain waves and all that, I'm not quite sure. But all of us are thinkers. We think about lots of things. What do you think about the weather? What do you think about the Browns going to the Super Bowl? That's a good thought, right? I see people clapping, yeah. What do you think about uh, the little baby that was born this week? What was his name? George. George. Alexander. Louis. Louis. Yes, Luis. What do you think about him? What do you, and so we know that not only do we think, but our thoughts have costs associated with them. They cost us something. Because, and the costs are some things like this. How personal is it? What will others think about my thought? And how will it affect the way that I live my life? And so some thoughts are really have no cost to them at all. I mean, who cares about what you think about the weather and I think about the weather? No cost there. But how about if, you, if I came up to you and said, what do you think about Trayvon Martin? Or what do you think about... DOMA. We talk about DOMA, the Defense of Marriage Act. But what do you think about same-sex same sex marriage? What do you think about those kinds of things? Or what do you think about what it means to, to love people who aren't like you? 
Or what does it mean to be really responsible with your money? What do you think about that? You see, now these will carry a little more cost to them. A little more costly thoughts. People might not agree with me. Very personal. What will others think? How will it affect my life if I truly live out what I am thinking? So these kinds of questions go deeper. But there is one question that is the deepest. There is one question that goes beyond all. And the costs of this thought and what you think about this are eternally and they have eternal ramifications. We're going to look at that question today. And again, it's the, it is the, I call it the question of all questions. And again, it is going to be something that's going to cost you a lot. And what your answer is, who knows? But we're going to face that question today. It's a question that Jesus is going to ask his disciples. But see, that same question is being asked to all of us. Even today, 2,000 years later, we're asking the same exact question. To every person who was gathered here this morning, we had 100, 200 people the first hour, and for the couple hundred people here, and for the couple hundred people who will be here next hour, every single one of us as thinkers are faced with this question. We're going to ponder that and explore that this morning. I am so glad you are here to worship and to hear what God has to say this morning in his word. So, if you have your Bible, we're going to be in the book of Mark, chapter 8. We've been walking for a while now through the book of Mark. What what does the gospel writer have to say to us? What is his message? And uh, a very interesting passage this morning. Chapter 8, we're going to be in verse 27. If you don't have a Bible, we'll be projected for you. You can read along. The setting is with Jesus and his disciples. They're coming out of Bethsaida, and they're heading to Caesarea Philippi. It's about a 25-mile journey. And for those who walk about two, three, four miles an hour, you can tell this is going to be an all-day experience walking together along the path. Can you imagine all the things that they would have talked about along the path? Well, we get a glimpse. We get some snapshots of what they did talk about. And Jesus is wanting to find out a few things. So verse 27, let's start reading. Jesus went on with his disciples to the villages of Caesarea Philippi. And on the way, he asked his disciples, Who do people say that I am? And they told him, John the Baptist. Others say Elijah. And others, one of the prophets. See, up until this point, the, the crowds who have been following Jesus are huge. He is so popular. I mean, he's been healing people. He has been feeding thousands of people with meager portions. He has been teaching with authority. And people are amazed. He has this kind of following that we would associate with with royalty or rock stars or professional athletes. I mean, people just want to be around him. And so Jesus is checking in with his disciples. What are the masses? What are they saying about me? And the answers revolve around some good guys in the long history of Israel. Some think you're a reincarnated John the Baptist. Some people think you're Elijah. Some people think that you're some other prophet. And that's kind of the word on the street. Very nice compliments of, of who people think Jesus is. Nice comparisons. You see, with Jesus, he, he now turns to his real question You see, the crowds will have their answers, but Jesus wants to follow up with another question. Verse 29, this is what Jesus will say. And he asked them, But who do you say that I am? See, now the finger is pointing not in the direction of the crowds and what they think. Jesus isn't really interested in what's trending on Twitter about him or about Facebook or any of these things about blog. He, he doesn't care what the masses are saying. In this moment, he is now pointing the finger very specifically at all of the people who are with him and individually, and they're saying, who do you say that I am? You see, it's one thing to ask a crowd, what do you think about my shirt? What do you think about this shirt? Do you like it? Yeah, you see? 
It's funny, the first hour people are like, yeah, we love your shirts. You might be sitting there thinking, ah, it's got pinstripes, or it reminds me of the Yankees or something. I don't, know what, I don't know what you think about this shirt. But see, in a crowd, it's one thing to have an opinion. There are no costs associated to having an opinion and a thought, because you can always disassociate yourself from these things. But if I said, Alice and Mattis, what do you think about my shirt? You see, it's much more personal, right? Now I'm putting her on the spot to say, what do you think about this? And then the costs go way up. You are now having to come up with an answer for yourself. You're now projecting words. Your thought is out there, and it has a cost associated with it. And that's what Jesus is saying. And there is no other question that is more important than this one. Jesus has been waiting to ask this question. And Mark, as he has put his gospel together, eight chapters in, has probably been waiting to get this story inserted so that he can now tell and ask the question of all questions. Who do you say that I am? 2,000 years later, we're asking the same question. And if we had a microphone, we could go from person to person. What do you say? What's your answer? We're going to do that third hour with everybody who comes. We're going to, yeah. What do you say of who I am? You see, before you answer that question, and you're already thinking, because as a good thinker, you're already pondering that, but let's hear what Peter's going to say. Maybe we can glean something from his answer before we have our answer. So, the back half of verse 29. Peter answered him, you are the Christ. And he strictly, this is Jesus now, he strictly charged them to tell no one about him. Peter's answer, you are the Christ. And the word actually means the Messiah, the anointed one. And from a very young age, Peter would have been growing up hearing this from his parents that one day there was going to be a triumphant ruler. He was going to come, the Messiah, the Mighty One, in all power and in all glory, to set the record straight. Someone who would go against all other powers and win. He would triumph. Look out for this. The Messiah is coming. And so Peter, he ventures out with his answer. You are this person, the Christ. And then we have this curious verse, verse 30. Jesus says, he strictly charged them to tell no one about him. Keep quiet. Doesn't he have the right answer? Isn't he saying the right thing? And what we will learn is that Peter has the right title. The Messiah he is. The Christ he is. But... The understanding of who the Messiah is, Peter is lacking. And Jesus says, don't tell people that. It's not quite right. Much like if, you know, we grow up and there's lots of things in life we don't quite understand. And from a young age, one of those big things is thunder, right? And I was talking to my wife, you know, how did you, my grand, she said her grandmother explained thunder being that thing where God is rearranging furniture up in heaven, right? Or he's bowling, or some people even have the thought that it's when clouds come together that makes that noise, right? No, no let's keep that quiet. It's not quite how it works. And Jesus is saying the same thing to Peter. You, you don't understand what you're saying. Don't tell people that. He strictly charged them. But what does it mean then to be the Messiah? You see, Jesus follows that up in his next portion here in verse 31. What does it mean? Well, he began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders and the chief priests and the scribes, and be killed. And after three days, rise again. I love verse 32. And he said this plainly. This was shocking news, right? 
As, it's just shocking news to Peter. As one writer would say, Jesus' life and mission is not about victory and success, much like Peter thought, but about rejection, suffering, and death. <laughs> Wait a second. Even though he said this plainly to them in very straightforward language, I can still imagine Peter being there like, you've got to be kidding me, right? Probably bewildered. And the ones who are going to kill the Messiah are going to be scribes and teachers of the law. Death, a suffering Messiah. And passages like you just heard Jim talk about, Isaiah 53, Nowhere would they have connected the dots that Isaiah 53 was talking about the Messiah. I mean, he was despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows, acquainted with grief, one whom men hide their faces. He was despised and we esteemed him not. Surely he borne our griefs, carried our sorrows, yet he, we esteemed him stricken, smitten, and afflicted by God. He was pierced for our transgressions, crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace, and with his wounds we are healed. No way is that talking about the Messiah. Really? And what Jesus is now doing is connecting the dots from those prophecies to himself. This is what it means to be the Messiah. Peter, <laughs> he can't accept this. He's, he, this is too much for him. Peter, as we know from other readings, he's very impulsive. He's much, he just puts it out there like it is. And he pulls Jesus aside, and he has a few words with him. Verse 30, back half of verse 32, the next scene. Peter is now taking Jesus aside. And he says this, and he began to rebuke him. Very strong language. But turning and seeing his disciples, he rebuked Peter, and he said, Get behind me, Satan, for you are not setting your mind on the things of God, but on the things of man. You see, Peter's words are, are very tough. Rebuke, aggressive but Jesus' words are just as strong. He has to say it this strong so Peter understands that if you set your mind on the things that you want and who you think that I am, you're missing it. I am not going to be someone who you want me to be. There's a different trajectory of, of where I am going. I am the one you say Christ, Messiah, but the one who will suffer and die and rise again. Who do you say he is? What do you think about Jesus Christ? You've heard Peter's answers, the one he longed for, but really he was needing, it's an important word, he was needing something much different than the triumphant ruler who was going to come and save the day for him and who they could ride the coattails of into glory, right? No. What about you? As you sit like the thinker and ponder, who is Jesus? Who is he? You see, we have an advantage here, don't we? I mean, we have the New Testament, we have the Old Testament, we piece them together. We see the whole story from creation to Genesis 3. There's a fall, and that man is on this quest and trying to figure it out in his sin. And, try, and, and not until we get to the New Testament in Mark, and it talks about the one who is coming. Here he is. It's like the center stage. He is talking about himself. He is going to suffer and die. Why? To pay the penalty and price for sin. And then the story continues that one day he is going to return again and set the scales even. He is going to pay back. It is going to be made right. A new heaven and a new earth and his glory. It's going to be wonderful. And so we get to see that whole story. See, Peter is looking to the very, very end of riding the coattails of the one who will come and be the triumphant ruler. And it's not like that. 
the Messiah was to be the one who was going to suffer and die. We get to see that. And so the question is, who is he? And at Riverwood, we talk about that question a lot, and we use this tool. If you're wondering and questioning, who is Jesus Christ? It's the story. It talks about how did it all begin, what went wrong, and how was there one who restored and saved it all? His name is Jesus Christ, the Messiah, the one who suffered. And if you want one of these, we have them out at the kiosks and counters. You can come get this one from me as well. The question of all question needs an answer. Who is he? And you sit there and you say, yes, I resonate with that. He is the Christ, the suffering servant, the Messiah. I believe that. If you do, there is a cost associated with that. It's going to cost you something. The question of all questions to have the right answer, something that is deeply personal and something that others will if you put that out there, might hate you for. It has a cost, and Jesus wants his disciples to be aware of that. And so he continues. If you're sincere, if you understand what it means, verse 34, let's continue on. Calling the crowd to him with his disciples, he said to them, If anyone would come after me, let him deny himself, and take up his cross and follow me. If you understand who Jesus Christ is, would it, then there is a different way to live life. A verse we've probably heard numerous times, right? To follow after him, to come after him, to be one of his. If you truly are someone who is signed on the dotted line that he is your suffering servant who has paid the price for you, then you follow him. Much like a, a teacher and a, rab, a rabbi with his students, you would follow. Jesus says, if you're going to come after me, this is what it means. And he uses this word. He says, to deny himself. To deny yourself. What does that mean? You see, so many times we hear the word deny yourself, and we put it in the context of Lent, don't we? I'm going to deny myself chocolate. I'm going to deny myself coffee. I like to deny myself celery. <laughs> or whatever it is. You're denying yourself something. But this isn't what he's talking about, denying in that kind of sense. One commentator says it best. He says this, It is not the denial of something to the self that Jesus is speaking of, but the denial of the self itself. Now, I'm going to say that again, because there is, it's a lot to chew on. I know on Sunday morning at uh, 1032, that's a lot to chew on. But this is huge. It is not the denial of something to the self that Jesus is talking about, but the denial of the self itself. Let's ponder that for a moment. What does denying self look like? It's about denying what the world is putting out there to say to follow and do. It's about denying all of the sinful nature and the desires that we want and the things that we so desperately are chasing after in this life and we, we associate them with the meaning of life. All the things that, this, that we can have as humanistic little idols that we place and we revolve our lives around. Denying self is this holistic approach. It's about this word surrendering. Surrendering everything. And in the Lord's Prayer, we say, His will be done on earth. And it's to ask that question of every area of our life. His will be done in my home. His will be done as a father or a mother. What does it mean for His will to be done as a husband what does it mean for his will to be done as a neighbor? What does it mean his will be done as a co-worker? His will be done in my thought life. His will be done with my money. His will be done, and the list goes on and on. This is what it means to have this 
kind of relationship with him, if he is your suffering servant, you come after him, then this is what it's going to cost. You surrender everything. All of it is his. All of it. All of you. And so he adds on to this idea with a picture. In case they weren't capturing and understanding that, he says this. It's about denying yourself. And he says this, taking up your cross. Let him deny himself and take up his cross. The cross, we see it everywhere in culture, right? In art, hanging around people's necks, maybe even tattoos. We see the cross everywhere. It's a very common image. And when we hear the phrase to bear the cross, we sometimes associate that with the inconveniences that we deal with in life, like when your air conditioner goes out in your car, it's like, I am bearing this cross, right? And we use that in our language that way, a very common phrase, and, we use, and Jesus is saying, no, that's not what it's like. And contextually, for the first century people to hear, to take up a cross, this was something that was vile, something that was horrible. I mean, the guilty would carry a cross beam through town. And it was a very public display. Everybody saw it. And they saw that that person was guilty of something. And they would walk through town. And it would be agonizing, difficult. And everybody knew what the end of that story was going to be. A long and agonizing, hanging on a cross, naked, shameful kind of death. And so what Peter, uh, Jesus is telling Peter is that if you are serious about coming after me, there is a cost associated with that. It's about denying yourself. It's about daily killing your will and the things that you want in your sinful desire and following me. And he's asking them, are you going to do it? Are you willing to follow me wherever the pain and suffering and the inconvenience and the mockery and the being made fun of? Are you willing to walk that similar path? That's what it means to call me your suffering servant and Messiah. You see, at this point, the disciples are probably thinking to themselves, oh my gosh, what do we get ourselves into here? Really? You see, we want to follow this guy. He's popular. He's good. He's doing great things. This suffering, dying, why? What's the, why does it have to be this way? And Jesus follows it up in verse 35, and he he says it like this. Whoever would save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake and the gospel's will save it. Interesting, right? Whoever, it's this paradox. If you think you are winning and if you're listening to the world and you have it all and you are winning, you're losing. But if you are losing because of me and my gospel, you are winning. What does it profit a man to gain the whole world and forfeit his soul? What can a man give in return for his soul? For whoever is ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, of him will the Son of Man also be ashamed when he comes in the glory of his Father with his holy angels. And what Jesus is doing is, is, is giving them rationale of why do you do this? What's the point? And Jesus says, if you are going to be someone who's going to win 
It's about losing with me. Everything else is a complete waste. If it's about winning according to the world and having lots of things and lots of accumulated wealth and a nice family and a picket fence, and if that is the ultimate, you are actually losing. And Jesus says, this is what it means to follow after me. And from this point in Mark's gospel, his popularity dwindles. See, the crowds are roaring. But at this point, things are thinning out a bit. Are we really going to follow this guy? This teaching is very hard. It's very difficult. I don't know if we can follow him in this way. What is it going to cost me to call him my suffering servant? It's going to cost you everything. And in the end, you'll gain it all. Are you willing to walk down that path with him? Where are you at with the question of all questions this morning? See, honestly, as a pastor, it's these kinds of passages that scare me. It scares me. Because I know how easy it is in our culture to come and stay at an arm's length away from really knowing the suffering Messiah. And much like Peter, many times he's, he's the good God who gives us this and that, and I pray, and, I, and he's at an arm's length, and we, we kind of visit when we want to, and, and he's like, it's not like that. And this morning, he reminds us that if you call him your suffering servant, there is a cost associated with living that way. Riverwood Community Chapel, are we willing to live this kind of life? Are we up to it? This is what it means to be a Christ follower. To call him your suffering servant and Lord, this is what it means. The question of all questions, where are you at this morning? We're going to spend more time reflecting on that thinking about that, pondering. Where are you at this morning? The question that demands an answer. Let me pray for us. Dear God, we, we come before you and we give you the honor and the glory. And it is in that we follow. And following is not easy. And you lay it out in plain language that if we call you the Christ, the Messiah, the one who has saved us. There are wonderful things associated with that, but it comes at a cost. To surrender it all, to hand over the sword to you, to say, do as you wish in my life. May you impress this upon your people here, this hour, this morning, who are in this moment. May your spirit impress upon us the seriousness of that question and the seriousness of our answer to it. We give you thanks. May you renew us and transform us for your kingdom, for your glory. We pray this in your name. Amen.